The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, Dr. Richard Drake. How you doing, my friend? Hey, guy, Dr. Guy Yatros. I'm doing well. well yeah, I was just complaining that it's cold here in Texas. You know, it's 45 degrees, and what did your buddy say it was in Colorado? Minus 20-something, I think he said. Oh. Uh, Jeff Harris, I think we'll be seeing him, and uh, he was out skiing in it, though, he said. Uh, I think we'll be seeing him in a couple of days uh, when everyone comes here to Florida to our symposium. I hope to see some of you all here as well. well excited to have everyone on, on board tonight. Uh, one of Rich and mine favorite subjects. We're going to talk about the, the devices we do. I think we might actually have six in here. Uh, so uh, to, to talk about uh, all together. And so we're going to get, get to it. Um, for those of you who don't know us, I'm Dr. Guy Yetros. This is my partner, Richard Drake. We've been working together over a dozen years. Uh, we put together a lot of systems that help dentists treat sleep apnea in their practices. We've helped uh, thousands of dentists learn how to do this. We've helped thousands of patients. Uh, we don't know everything, but I think we know a whole lot of what not to do. <laughs> and so we'll make sure we hit those points today and, and try to help you understand how to treat uh, sleep apnea in your dental practices. Uh, we have been uh, using the the four pillars as kind of the basis for, for our teaching for the last 10 years or so. Uh, what we mean by that is if you have these four crucial uh, parts to your dental sleep practice, if you have systems and team members to help you screen your patients, uh, to identify which ones are at risk, and then get them tested, systems and team members, and maybe outside doctors to help you test them, and then you have ways of treating them, that's what we're going to concentrate on today. That's why we have it highlighted in red. And then you get billed and get paid. If we can put those systems in place, uh, you will be really successful in helping a lot of patients in dental sleep medicine. Dental sleep is not difficult. I've said this a bunch of times, but it's complex. There's a lot of parts that go into it, and that's what we're going to help you unravel uh, today uh, as we go through each one of these devices in detail. Right, Rich? <laughs> yeah, we're going to do all of that in 20 minutes, yeah. so talk fast. Talk fast. Now, we've got four that we're going to concentrate on, uh, four or five that I would say uh, make up for the vast majority of our devices that we do on a daily basis. I know Rich does 60, 70, 80 devices a month in his practice. Uh, we, we do quite a few as well, not quite those numbers. Uh, but we're going to go through how you do this, and we're going to talk about how you select the devices. And I'm going to give you a real easy way after we go through all the, 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 the thought processes, a way that you can decide, I think, Rich, in what, two, three seconds. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It's a real quick, easy way that will work 95% of the time. But you have to stay tuned for that because we want to teach you a little bit on how uh, on how to, to think about this. And uh, this is different than maybe if you listen to one of our lectures in the past. We've concentrated on the devices. And uh, Rich and I were talking this week. We've been working together for, like we said, almost a dozen years. And almost as many years as that ago, we sat down. I remember, Rich, you and I, when we uh, started designing our dental sleep software that we call DS3, we decided, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could help the dentist decide which device to do? And we had many conversations about, you know, well, well, how do you decide? Well, how do you decide? And what do we think about? What are the factors? And we started writing those down, and we started rating different devices based on those factors. And we came up with a cool software program because I like software, and, you know, we like writing algorithms but that, that helps you select this. But we wouldn't want you to rely on this. What I would like you to do is to think about those conversations, gosh, it's been 10 years ago or so we were having those, and uh, they've really come to true that we kind of do the second nature, and I think we're going to go through each of these things that we ask you to evaluate when evaluating the device and why we think they're important to evaluate. I think to start with the big yeah, one, I, right? I, yeah, I think that's the, the principles. You know, I, I think we all like shortcuts, Guy. You know, uh, I had somebody the other day ask me at a course, Guy said, you know, what? what's the secret, man, to your success? You're making all these devices, you're doing this. And I said, well, you get up about six in the morning, you go to the office, you know, you get home about 6.30, you do that every day for 20 years. And he goes, oh man, I was afraid you were gonna say that. <laughs> you know, cause we're all, we're all looking for shortcuts, you know, we're an overnight success in 20 years in, in what we do. So I, I, I like what you said there, Guy, cause it's like, let's drive home these principles. If you understand these principles and you understand when we put somebody in this type of device and they exhibit these types of behaviors or they have these types of traits, it may be a good thing and it may not. So keep keep that in your mind as we go through this. 
Yeah, and I think this is probably one of the big ones here, bruxism. And, uh, you know, I think all apneic patients, brux to some extent, we know there's an association there. And so I guess what it comes down to is how destructive it is. Or, you know, is our device going to hold up? Uh, does it allow the device allow you to go side to side? To, uh, I remember having a conversation with Jameson Spencer about this, and he really believes that, and I, and I agree in, in many cases, that if people are real lateral grinders that, if we don't let them do that, sometimes they're not as comfortable with the devices if we do. Now, sometimes you let them grind too much and they're going to break it too. So certain devices hold up better. How do we know if they're brooks? Well, we can look at their teeth. Uh, but I think as you're doing your exam, look at their masseters. And, you know, they have these really huge masseters. Uh, what do their wear patterns look like? And uh, if we're thinking that breaking is an issue, uh, we need, we'll need. we talk about which devices are a little stronger. We'll, we'll think about that. Which ones allow the the sideways movement, and then uh, we can talk about ones that decrease the force at which you can brux. I mean, uh, uh, there's a really neat thing called an NTI that, uh, uh, that that a lot of you all have done before. What happens when you put something in someone's front teeth right in the middle and the back teeth don't hit? Yeah, you, you lock out 80% of those muscle fibers from fire and they just can't fire, so no matter what you do. So I, I think you touched on, Guy, the big masters. You know, yeah. when we look at somebody's teeth like that, well, they've been grinding at some point in the past for sure. Right. So just have them bite as hard as they can, you know, and feel their masseters. And, you know, if, if their masseter immediately starts to kind of quiver like that, then, you you know, that muscle's going, oh, please, not anymore. You know, I did that all night long. So... And then, like you said, too, I like that. Look at the wear, you know, patterns. So if I'm getting out on my canine, you know, the only thing that's worn are my canines. Well, I got to get my jaw out there. Right. So you might think about maybe not using a herbst in that particular instance because it doesn't allow me very much. Those are the types of principles that we're going to talk about tonight and how they apply to which device we use. Right. And uh, I think these two go hand in hand. Uh, people have joint problems. I mentioned earlier, and I want to emphasize that, that if you put a discluding uh, element, you have something where you only hit in the front, it does one thing for sure and one thing most of the time. And what Rich already mentioned, what it does most of the time is our bodies can't fire as many muscle fibers when our back teeth don't come together. So it decreases the muscle activity, so your, th your device is going to hold up better. But also it moves the fulcrum for sure towards the front. So I don't know about you, Rich, but when I'm trying to get a lock nut off of a, my bicycle or my boat or something, you put it real near the hinge, you get more grip on it than if you put it out there on the tee. So by having that bite out towards the front, we're not your devices will hold up better because the amount of force they can generate with the same muscles, even if they could all fire, is less. Okay, but now right. let's contrast this to this patient. Let's say a patient has a problem in their joint. Let's say... Their joint, they're on bone to bone, that their disc is anteriorly dislocated uh, forward. Maybe it reduces, maybe it doesn't, but maybe, you know, when they clench real hard, uh, they're, 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 they're sitting on the retrodiscal tissue. Um, now you have someone only bite in the front. What happens to that joint? Man, you're loading it up, aren't you? You're, you're taking no back teeth to stop it. So if you think about the angle there and the master pulling, you're putting all that pressure on that joint because the back teeth aren't aren't stopping it there's nothing to keep all that force from torquing so the last thing in the world you want to do <coughs> excuse me on someone with the actual internal joint problem where they have pain or there's really a lot of breakdown if you don't want to make that joint worse you want to make sure it hits all the way around so that's one take-home message we can talk about when we're looking at these devices uh, we want to hit all the way around or at least on on the back i mean there's other things we can talk about the joint for probably three days i think there's three-day courses on tmj issues and we could Talk, talk, talk about it for hours, but I think that's one of the big things we look at. What anything else on that, Rich? I have a couple more, but I'm no. doing all the talk. Like, like you said, you know, I, I would say ask if there's a history of that. You know, right. does it click and pop? You know, does it make noise? E almost every single day, I have a patient go, you know, my jaw started to click and pop since I've been wearing that device. It never did that before, and I go back to my progress note, and it says right there history of clicking and popping at times in the past that's been sporadic right. you know so you know some of this is cover yourself you know with with this but i think it's also just good practice to like you said we could talk about it for three days so doc document what's there and move on yeah i think two other important parts as far as dental devices go if they have joint problems if they can't open wide then that limits the devices we can do because some of them are harder to get in 
and the other if they have a deviation or deflection, so the jaw is moving back and forth. You might want to know that because certain devices only go forward, and they kind of lock you in, and then you can have a problem. So, you know, I, we treat people with joint problems daily, but just understanding what's going on and using, we, we like to say the saying that Rich taught me years ago, use your brain a little bit here uh, and, and think about the device you're going to do. If they can only open 30 millimeters, well, certain devices that are all locked together, maybe they can't get it in. And by thinking of the bite, the deep overvites, these are these are challenging at times, uh, and you'll you'll see some of these patients. So, uh, I know Rich, uh, we we talk about uh, about this and, and the different devices when we get to those. What are what are your you know considerations when you see a bite like this with 100% vertical overlap? Well, it's certainly how far they can open. So if if this guy is, let's say this is a young lady and she clinches a lot. She's not grinding, but she's clinching. So she's got mass, big masters. And you say, open your mouth. And she goes, you know, she can't open very far. Uh, that That's one consideration. You know, when you, you think about uh, in this particular case, if I was going to use a dream tap on this patient, well, she might have to open eight or nine millimeters to get to here. And then the dream taps 10 millimeters to get to there. That's, 18. You check my math, but that's 18. Yeah. Right. What if she can only open 22? She's, you know, she's going to feel like she's like that. So there's a couple of them for you. What else you got? Well, and then also I think these people sometimes, if they can open, need a little more room. Like this patient in particular is the reason I picked this particular uh, uh, case, because look how narrow their arch is. And look how they got this deep overbite. And if you put the thinnest thing out there, well, we think we're doing them a favor, but now there's still no room for the tongue. So sometimes we, if they have a good opening, they can open 60 millimeters, then we might want to open this patient a little bit more room to allow more room for what we call the box. Inside there, that tongue's all, we want to give it a little bit more room. So again, you got to think about the patients, and, and it's not all deep bites. We don't want to open them up. Sometimes we do, uh, and understand certain devices open them up better. I see some questions coming in. Uh, we have our DS3 team. That's all they do all day long is help dentists do dental sleep. They're answering some of them. Uh, we will get to them all before it's over. So really, I appreciate you all uh, adding those on there. We've got uh, several hundred people signed up today, so we can't open the mics. But if you'll type your questions in, we will answer them uh, or make up something before the night. So <laughs> we'll, we'll try to answer them. So tongue size, I think these are all kind of related now. we got the deep bite, the big tongue. You know, what are... You know, what are we thinking here, Rich? Uh, we we want to make a little room for that's them, a, right? That's a big old tongue, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I know we'll talk a little bit about this more lately, but, you you know, there's there's the box there. Think about that box. And all we really have control over when we make a dental device is how well it fits. That's within my control. How much vertical I use when I start. That's under my control when I take the bite. And how much we, where we start them at and how quickly we, we titrate them. And the tongue size is a big part of how much vertical we use. Mm -hmm. So just like you said previously, that's how this relates to a deep bite. That if that person can't breathe through their nose and they're a mouth breather and they have some you know, range of motion, maybe I want to I want to open that person up more to make more room for the box. That makes sense. 100%. And then some devices have apparatuses that impede the tongue space. And I don't know that we have to worry too much because a tongue will spread out like with a tap or so forth. But occasionally you'll get a tongue like this. Well, it'll irritate their tongue. They'll get ulcers on their tongue from rubbing up against it. So so keeping that in mind as well. And then retention. Uh, you know, what about this patient? It's going to be hard to get this one to stay in because the teeth are really short. And, you know, we're going to go into all those embrasures. We're going to have a big mess on our hands. Uh, what do we do when we don't have retention? And uh, here's what I want everyone to keep in mind. Um, I always ask this. If you come to one of the live courses, I always ask you, uh, you know, what's the answer to everything? And the answer is it always is it, it depends. Yeah. Do you want these things to fit tight? And everybody always says, yes, we do. Well, do you? What about if they've got a two five-unit bridges that are high water gold with three ponics that G.V. Black himself <laughs> did, I always say. Do you want them pulling on this thing so hard that it's just going to rip their crown and bridge out of their mouth, or do you want it to fit a little looser? And what happens if you can't make it fit tight, like in this case? Then the design feature you have to keep in mind is if it's going to fit loose, if you lock the upper and lower jaw together with the device design, it's probably going to pop out of it. The patient's going to wake up, 
was stuck to one of their arches, usually to the top. So you need to have a feature that allows the mouth to open but keeps it from going back, like a dorsal or sometimes a herps or things that'll keep the, the, the forward position without when they open their mouth without pulling it off the teeth. So you've got to design right. that into your design. If you don't want to make a fixed monoblock on this patient, you know, back in the days when we did that because they'll never stay in because we can't get it to stay in. We can't get the fit tight enough for them not to pop out of the device. And I think that's really the tape home. Only if we put their head in a vice. Which you can do. We do use chin straps occasionally. I yeah. mean, uh, that, that would be, you know, if you can't. That's another get... tool in your bag right. in this case like this. Yes. Absolutely. But in this case, we can't get retention. Or if you don't want it to fit tight or even edentulous patients, remember to keep it so that uh, if they open their mouth, if they can do this and the device doesn't pop out, that's the one you want with they, when they have poor retention or retention issues. And then missing teeth. I think this one, uh, you know, we, we have, um, for our members, every other Wednesday night, Rich or myself has a private webinar with our members, our DS3 members, and, and they ask us questions, and we ask them to bring cases to us, and we, we uh, go through a lot of the cases, and you know, a lot of times the people will say, you know, what's the best device on, on, on a case like this? And, uh, well, we'll start by what's not the best device. I think maybe one that attaches down here to these molders that aren't here, that that's where the hinge is or where a lot of the force is, that's probably one we wouldn't want to do, right? <laughs> I think you got to think about yeah, where these teeth are. I think most of you as dentists know most of this. Right. So, you know, get a sample of all the six devices we're going to talk about tonight, get their patient's models and go, oh, that wouldn't work. You know, when you, when you go, hey, yeah, if I'm going to make an EMA for this particular patient, you go, well, oh, that's not going to work real well because there's nothing at all to hold that you know, back, back there. So most of it, I think, you know, and again, use your brain. Absolutely. And so in this case, you know, and it, it kind of goes back to also not fitting tightly. Maybe we can't get us to fit tightly. So we want one that opens. Uh, this might be a better one for a tap because the teeth that are missing are in the back, but if the teeth that are missing are in the front, maybe a different device might work better. So uh, just thinking about this as you go through, and then I think this one's a big one, Rich, you taught me this one years ago. And uh, I think it's, if I had to say the number one thing you can do to make your cases successful is think about the nose. I mean, we, we move the jaw forward, we do these devices, but getting patients to breathe through their nose is important in, in, in success and identifying those patients that can't uh, before we begin treatment and thinking about what we're going to do about that is, I think, critical to being successful. I'm trying to look at that guy. I, I can't even hardly look at him right because his nose is so messed up. <laughs> I was going to put Zyther's myself on there, no. but, but I found someone a little bit worse. It was hard to do. <laughs> he probably stopped a fist with that nose at one point, didn't he? Yeah, I, I did. I did. I don't know about this guy. <laughs> I found this guy on the internet. But, uh, you know, so we think about the nose and, and having a nasal uh, issues myself. I can tell you firsthand, when you can't breathe through your nose, it it's claustrophobic if you can't open your mouth or swallow. Not that you can't deal with it if you had to. But if you give someone a, a device that locks their mouth in place and they can't open, and you feel like, I can't, can't open my mouth if I have to, it's harder for a, someone who can't breathe through their nose to get used to. They, they kind of freak out at first. You got to talk them off the ledge because they're used to not breathing through their nose. Uh, at the same time, we want to encourage them to breathe through their nose. So that's where you get in the trouble. So you know, make it real open so they can breathe through their mouth, but they don't work quite as well. So make it so they can breathe through their mouths so that are not close to claustrophobic. This guy, get him doing some nasal strips, get him to the ENT, uh, do nose cones, uh, flow nays, we big one on topical steroids, all those things in conjunction with a non-claustrophobic device that allows him to, 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 to be able to breathe through his mouth, uh, I think is the first step. Because if we don't wear the devices, I don't care how well they work, that's the first, that's what we have over CPAP is compliance. Anything else on that other? Rich, all right. It's a big deal. It Nasal is. patency is a big deal. It so is. spend some time on it. Ask about it. You didn't mention the famous uh, nose test, you know, the guy who oh, sure. nose test, you know, plug one side and breathe in, you know, is that a typical day? You know, at night, most nights, can you keep your lips together and breathe through your nose? I always ask that question every time I do a consult. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the guy will say, yeah, and his wife's sitting there going, no. Every time I look over there, <laughs> you know, it's like that. So, absolutely. I see more questions coming in. We will get to those 
uh, I know our team's answering some of them, and if they don't, I see at least one of them up there that we're going to answer uh, at the end of the webinar. So we'll we'll just get those as uh, at the end and hang in there. Patient dexterity. Now in Florida, Rich, I don't know about in Texas, but we have a huge Medicare population, and uh, you know some of these older people's had strokes, various issues, and uh, we got to really consider which device we're going to give them if they're going to be able to take it in and out of their mouth or adjust it. Uh, uh, it's 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 important. I don't know if you have as much as we do in Texas. Well, or do they have a caretaker who can help them, or do they live two hours away? <clears throat> you know, you can. We we have people live around the corner, and they can swing by, and we adjust it for them. Uh, that's not the same if they live two hours away, you know, and they don't have anybody who checks in on them. So again, it's a consideration. It's not a real real big deal. I don't think it's as big as some of these other things we're talking about, but. Pay attention to it. Well, there's two things to this. What you're mentioning is adjusting the device, like like adjusting the arms. That's true. Putting it in, taking it out is also uh, something. Certainly, that's a consideration, but they can always come by the office and we can do that. But you've got patients here who've got strokes. They've only got one arm they can use. You don't. It goes back to fitting too tightly. Can they actually physically take this thing in and out? Is it going to have to snap in? Right. You've got, you know, you go back to a, maybe a looser device that can right. go in one piece at a time. So. I've had these patients, they just can't get it in. And we're like, gosh, we just didn't think this thing through before we before we did mm -hmm. it. And then comfort. So I think uh, I think we all want them comfortable, um, but sometimes that comes at a cost of, uh, of fitting looser, of not as tight as being able to open your mouth when we want to control vertical. <laughs> uh, we, we feel that the devices work better if we control the vertical and you don't open. Well, if you don't open the mouth and you're locked in, it's got to fit tighter and it's not quite as comfortable. So. I mean, when when I've given this lecture in person, Rich, people go, well, don't we want them all comfortable? <laughs> well, of course we do, but certain features that are desirable at times, like I say, retention, locking the vertical in place can decrease the comfort, but it can increase the efficacy. So uh, we've got to weigh those uh, against each other. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Guy. If you guys take away one thing from this tonight, you got to use your brain and you got to weigh the positives and negatives of each one because it's it's not the same. I know you all want a quick answer. In this case, what device would you make? Go through these things in your mind. It's the same stuff that we put in that device selector. That's what we, the things that we just talked about here that we've been talking about, in your mind, you should go through as you're talking to the patient, you're evaluating them. Absolutely. And cost, there's a lot of different costs to these devices. Uh, you know, some of them are two, three times uh, what the other ones are. Keep that in mind. Uh, I would suggest, and this is part of our billing webinar we're going to be having probably, and I think it comes up in May, where you might have different tiers of services based on uh, just the follow-up and, and maybe the device you do, maybe the warranty you internally give to that device. So I won't let the cat out of the bag for that, but there's a ways to accommodating the higher cost for some of these devices that are come with a three-year warranty from the the lab and uh, at a higher sticker price and uh, may, we'll have to pass it on to the patient somehow, but there's ways of doing that as well. So uh, I'll keep it in mind, but I, I wouldn't make that the, the single biggest decision. Okay, so those are the considerations. That's what went into our device selector. We're gonna get to the devices in a minute, but these devices are made out of, you know, basically most of them acrylic. We're gonna talk about a, a 3D printed polymer in a little bit that doesn't fall into this category. But for the most part, these devices are made out of acrylic, maybe some metal in them. Uh, but then inside the devices, there's different materials that touch the teeth. And there's more than three, I would say, liners that are out there. But I think there's three mostly used categories that we're going to talk about. And the most common or the one that you're most familiar with is just acrylic. It can be acrylic through and through. And it can be milled or it can be salt and pepper. Or, uh, I think the top one up there is actually an invested uh injected acrylic so uh, the, the you know they have different properties if they're um, injected versus milled versus salt and pepper they have less pores as you go down that spectrum uh, but uh, they're acrylic through and through and typically they'll either be all acrylic like we have here or we'll have acrylic with ball class that you can tighten and and and, and loosen and the big advantage of acrylic i think rich is that dentists are familiar with acrylic well are used to it when you say yeah, who you've been spending most of your life making things like that fit. You know, if it doesn't fit, you grind on it. If it's too loose, you can reline it, you know, in the mouth. There's there are different ways. It's absolutely. Some of the other materials, you can't do that, that we're going to talk about. So, you know, it definitely, um, 
seems like it lasts longer. It is a little harder. It is a little more brittle, therefore. But you remember, it's very, you know, strong in a in a compressive way. But if I'm putting some real weird torques on it and things like that, that's where we see that that back screw on a hurt sometimes pop off, or you know, the dorsal things like that. So again, all of those principles that we talked about should go into as you make these decisions. Absolutely. And uh, what's the, next? The uh, next one is what we would call our flex or our comfort material. There's different labs, call them different things, but it's that kind of rubbery liner. A lot of you have done hard, soft <laughs> bike guards that the patients really seem to like. So one of the questions is what's the most comfortable? Well, the most comfortable liner, I think most people would argue is, is or, or vote for is this flex material. It's kind of rubbery. It squishes around the undercuts and the patients, you know, can readily take it in and out and feel, uh, and feel it's comfortable. It has to be a little thicker because you got to have room for the acrylic and the liner. And I think you lose a little bit of control over tooth movement because the stuff kind of can squish around and it's a little harder to adjust. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned the acrylic, everybody can, can get the burr out and adjust it. Yeah. And when you, when you grind on this, it gunks up, you know, and it does that um, if it's too tight and if it's too loose, it's I can't add acrylic to this. No. You know, if it's too loose on the, on the lower right, I've taken where I've cut all of that flex material out and then I bonded, you know, acrylic or triad in there or something and refit it in the mouth. So part of it's one and part of it's the other. Right. Uh, that That's when we're trying to save a case, you know, from going back to the lab or doing something like that. But uh, these do pick up, I think they tend to pick up a little more odor guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have to clean mine more often. I have to take it to the office and put it in that tartar stain stuff in a baggie in the ultrasonic. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, that I, I hope y'all are doing that, you know, at your annual appointments. I, we take devices that just look absolutely disgusting, and they they look pretty good, you know, by the time you do that. Um, that that's great stuff to to clean them with. Absolutely, uh, we do have tricks for making these fit tighter. We'll talk about our hands-on courses that we can teach you a lot of cool things that you don't have to send back. And then the last material, and there, are, like I said, there are some other heat-sensitive materials out there, but this one's we're going to call it Thermacryl or AccuFit. Some of the labs call it and uh this is different than the one you heat up it goes in and then it shrinks back to its original position that's uh bruxy's material some people call and there's different materials this one when you heat it up it actually just like you mix the acrylic and when it cools it's like the acrylic hardened uh, and so you can keep reheating it and refitting it rich you've you've loved this material i remember i think your last time i saw your bass boat it was pretty much held together with this stuff right I was certainly holding the transducer on my trolling motor on my bass boat together. Uh, okay. But, uh, you know, it's cool stuff. You know, it's just hard as a rock and you heat it up in water, you know, um, in, in the microwave or you pour real hot water on it and it, and it gets soft and then it gets kind of gooey and sticky. And, you know, there's a learning curve here. I, I don't know that I would make your first dental device um, a thermocryl. Uh, like I did, you know, I was sitting there on, had my phone on speaker and this patient's looking at me and I'm talking to Keith Thornton and he's telling me how to do this. And she kept going, you sure you know what you're doing? Ah, absolutely. You know, we'll figure this out. But there's a trick to it. You know, when you heat it up and you put it in, how much do you heat it up? How long do you put it in? But the thing I love about this guy is I can always make it fit. Right. I can always make always. it fit. You know, I, yeah. But it, but it might be a little thicker now. The new taps are coming out with their AccuFit, and it's a little bit mm -hmm. thinner. Um, it, it does stain a little bit. It is a little more porous. You have to be a little more careful. It gets um, dirty. It gets stained that maybe won't even come out even in your cleaner at times. So I tell the patients, if and they go, oh, if they're real neurotic, you don't want to use this material but, because they, they can really yeah. get freaked out about it. Um, yeah, I remember one time, guy, a, a device coming in, and it, it would look just like that, but all the interproximal spaces, it had this kind of a lime green kind of color, and I was like, I just started doing this, and I'm thinking, I have no idea what that is, right. you know, I was like, you know, is it some kind of mold or something? It's like, no, and his wife happened to be there, and she goes, I know what that is. She goes, it's lettuce. Uh, all the guy eats is salads all the time, and he never <laughs> flosses his teeth. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. You know, he probably just had. So, uh, again, uh, uh, for the patient who's meticulous about those things, this might not be a good choice. But at the same time, it, we might have to use it because they're going to get some dental, dental work, work done. Yeah, and or, you can always make it tighter. If someone's coming, you know, from three hours away to see you and they're going on a big cruise or trip or something and you 
want to make sure that this thing fits, it's always going to fit because you can refit it right there in the mouth. So, so those are the three materials. Um, I told you earlier that there's a, a, a we have a, a way that will work 95. Would you say maybe more 95% of the time, Rich? Uh, that takes about one or two seconds, depending on which one of these methods you use. And so what we'd mm -hmm. say is you can use any of these methods. Just get the four devices and just uh, put them on the dartboard or. You, know, you can do rock, paper, scissors, or you can get four devices and four cups and have your assistant come in and pull one. And you know what? It's going to work. I mean, and, and we, we kid around about this, but, it, you know, there's bigger decisions that don't sleep than, than this most of the time. Uh, Rich, what do you always say? You can't make a bad, uh, a better one? To, what is your saying that you've told me? I, I, I say you can't make, make a wrong device, but you can make a better one. Right. You know, so Keith Thornton makes the tap. When a patient comes to see him, I don't think he's thinking about making him a dorsal. Right. right. And he has he has been very successful, very successful in his career at doing what he's doing. So, again, I, I like to teach guy that you pick pick one device and make five of them at least, and then another one and make five, and another one and make five. Right. Keeping in mind the things that we're talking about here, because one really may be contraindicated in a particular instance, because part of what makes us good at what we do is, number one, we made a lot of mistakes over the years. You know, it's always asked me how I know, right. you know, because I've made that mistake before. But it's also we learn how to make this work in our hands. Right. So these materials, you're most familiar with acrylic. You probably need the least amount of practice with that. You probably need the most amount of practice with with thermocryl because it's unlike anything that you've usually worked with before, but but keep those things in mind. Absolutely. Uh, some more questions coming in. We will get to them all. Uh, uh, just a little housekeeping here uh, halfway through the webinar. You will get CE for this. It'll give me to your email address that you registered with. You should have it in the next 48 hours. If you don't check your spam folder, if it's not there, then contact us. But most likely it's gonna it's gonna be there for you. We we send those out pretty promptly. Uh, our next webinar coming up is March 10th. It's Dr. Jagdeep Bidwadia. Uh, I've known him for many years, still have a hard time with his name at times, but I think I got it right there. He's a great a physician that uh, we're going to be talking about telemedicine. I'm excited about it. He's uh, It's going to be mostly uh, his uh, knowledge, and I'm going to be a little bit more of the no, no, uh, moderator. And then for the people kind of new to this, uh, we're saving teeth, but are you saving lives? It's going to be more of an overview of dental sleep medicine. So those put those dates down. And uh, we've mentioned the four pillars. That's what we help our members do, screen test, treat, and bill. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what we do at DS3, is we help do edu education, coaching, software, and support. We have a whole team of uh, people that that's all we do every day is help dentists do this in their practices. If you want to really jumpstart your sleep practice and your struggling with some things, I can tell you there's nothing better you can do than to come to one of our two-day courses. Uh, they're two days hands-on. We do uh, provisional devices. We do some sort of home sleep test monitoring. Uh, it's $12.95 for you and a team member. Uh, I promise you come to one of these myself. Dr. Murphy, uh, Mark Murphy's teaching some of these. Uh, I promise you either one of uh, us that you come to, you're going to leave. Whether you've been doing this new for a few months or you've been doing it for many years, you're going to get a lot out of it. Those are the upcoming ones on this side. Uh, and you can read, hopefully you can see that on your screen. There's other ones throughout the year we're doing. If you want you, uh, to consider coming to one, just type uh, course, and it'll give you $200 off. So uh, all you have to do is uh, type that. You know, uh, if you know the city, put it down. doesn't obligate you to anything. So if you're thinking about it, type it. That way uh, Mike or one of our team members will talk to you about the courses. Uh, no high pressure there, but at least you lock in the, the discount for, for that. It's a really good deal. And then if you want to know more about what we do, just type in, consultation or consult and uh, we will meet with you somehow that went on the next slide we will meet with you our team answer questions uh, I'll get to some of the questions about where the course is in a minute by the way uh, consultation we'll, we'll meet with you and your team if you want to know about billing anything that we can answer for you're gonna get a lot of free advice uh, of course we're gonna talk to you about how we can help you on a daily basis but it won't be any high pressure uh, and you're gonna get some real practical information because Rich and I are trying to help uh, everyone here uh, just do this in our practices. That's what we do. So let's talk a little bit more about the treating, and we'll put that slide back up in a little bit if you missed it. So uh, I see some courses coming in, and uh, our team can answer all your questions about that. I promise you we'll have a great time with those courses in addition to learning a lot. So type that in any time along the way. 
And uh, we're going to talk about- I want about to add, Guy, that yeah. that's still the cheapest way to get diagnosed and treated. That's true. Anywhere in the country. That's true. You get a sleep test and a dental device. So. You do. We, we're doing uh, provisional devices now. Uh, I think people really struggle with those. And everybody there gets a provisional device. We uh, we show you how to uh, hands on how to do those. We talk about hands on how to take bites, whether you're doing digital, like we got on the screen here, or whether you're doing them with the bite registration material. You get a sleep test. We go through the sleep test. Uh, I mean, it's a it's the most practical course in dental sleep medicine that you can go to. I promise you that. That's uh, uh, there's other great courses out there that teach you a lot of things, but it's the uh, the most practical one out there. Uh, and so we're going to get into the devices. Uh, we do want to mention you've got to have good impressions for these. Uh, and if you want to know more about the impression technique, if you don't have a, a scanner such as a CareStream, uh, we can tell you uh, at the course, we'll talk about how you do that. you got to get impressions. You've got to get good into the embrasures. You've got to get rather gingival margins so they get in those undercuts. We've been using this uh, um, CareStream 3600 for a little over a year now. Rich, I think you have two of these things, don't you? I do. I have two, and uh, we, you know, we like to see smoke coming out of that computer, man. That means we're using them, and things are going well. You know, I have an assistant guy who can, you know, she's getting the scans down to upper and lower on a not a difficult, uh, you know, patient with big. You're fighting tongues all the time as dentists, you know, uh, to you know six, seven, eight minutes now, you know, and it's it's really. Uh, going pretty fast, and and I think we've got all the bugs worked out of it. And I, um, I, I can't say enough about the care stream that I use, and uh, it works great. So I'm, I, I'd yeah. like to give. Them I would say it's the best investment I've made in many years uh, for speed, for patient comfort, and then for the care stream for cost because we're saving all the cost of impression material uh, with no annual fees on that. So look into it. We'll teach you at the course how you use this to take a bite, you don't even need any bite registration material. So you can go from patient in your chair to hitting a button and ordering the device with not having to mail anything through the mail, uh, the, the way we do that now. Okay, which device are we gonna do? Well, what are we trying to combat here? We're trying to combat this. This is what we're trying to do is to keep the, the tongue from falling back, uh, the jaw to move forward. And again, which device we use? Uh, the, there's better bells and whistles, but they're all gonna work. Uh, we're going to start by talking about Medicare. If you're a Medicare provider, Medicare has a certain standard, uh, which we could spend hours talking about why they have these standards, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're better devices, but they have to be Medicare approved, uh, cleared, rather, so that you can use them. And really, the two we use for that are the TAP and the HERPS devices. So uh, if you're doing a Medicare patient, you don't need a dartboard, uh, just doing a, uh, <laughs> a coin, we, we can decide between the two. So. Uh, I'll talk, start with the herps, and I think this is a good device to start with because my good buddy Steve Carsonson, who teaches with me down at the Pank Institute, uh, he, he told me he calls this the universal device because, you know, it'll work. You know, if you had to say one device has not a whole lot of contraindications, you know, it'll, it'll work in most, most every situation. So if you're not sure which device to do, certainly if it's a Medicare, you can consider the herps device. There's a lot of different forms out there from metal frameworks to acrylic to the really nice one. We like lots of Somnomed, uh, uh, Herbst Advance that the slides on the side. Uh, they all work by allowing your mouth to open and, and have some sort of a, a, a mechanism like this one. You turn a screw and it moves that back so it moves, moves the jaw forward. Um, Rich, uh, you use the, the, the Advance, Somnomed Advance, you use the, the, the standard Herbst, the single barrel, double barrel, what kind of guy are you? these days when it comes to herbs. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've used all of them. You know, Prosomnus has that new precision herbs out. That's, that's a that's milled smart. device. <clears throat> it's a little bit smaller, has a little bit lower uh, profile. Uh, you know, so sometimes we use that one. Um, I, I love the Somnomed ones as well because I like the flex lining, you know, that's in there. I don't know what Somnomed does, but my gosh, we don't have to adjust those, their devices very often, you know, when they come back. So, you know, we've, we've used a number of different labs. You know, being, being in Dental Sleep Solutions and doing what we do, I have to spread that around to, you know, a, a, a few people uh, as we do that, just, just to keep the, you know, the <laughs> people at, at bay there. But, but you know, I, I, I was looking for a truck the other day, Guy, and I went and drove a bunch of trucks. 
I liked them all, you know, I mean, you know, my 10 year old truck, you don't realize how much it just goes all over the road because you're used to it. So there are a lot of good devices out there that do it. Uh, but, but on the more or less side of this, these are exactly the things that we talked about initially, you know, where you're weighing the pros and cons of this. So, you know, when do we use it more? Certainly with Medicare patients, people with bigger tongues, they can't breathe as well through their nose. Um, you know, maybe a little bit less on somebody who's going to grind a lot. We talked about looking at the wear facets, you know, when they're, when they have to get way out to get on their canines and things like that. So these are all things that we want to, we want to pay attention to. Yeah. And, uh, I will mention that, that this does allow the mouth to open so it can fit looser, but sometimes they open too wide and it doesn't, you lose efficacy. So that's what these little hooks are for. I encourage you to always get the hooks because you can put rubber bands to, adjust how easily their mouth drops open. Understand if they have minimal teeth, you may not be able to use the elastics anyway, but always uh, have the ability to add the elastics because it can make this device go from not working that well to working really well when you uh, help encourage the mouth closing. And you can have a, a bump in the front, you can have an opening in the front, you can design this any way you want. So the other Medicare device is the tap and there's the dream tap and then the the tap three, the dream tap, the hooks on the bottom and the, the bows on the front here. And I think the next picture has both of them is the tap three, which was around before with the hooks on the top and the slots on the bottom. Uh, they both pull the jaw forward. They both have some pros and cons. Um, I think maybe just because I'm used to it and been doing it longer, I prefer the tap three still to the dream tap in most cases. Uh, just uh, I think that it um, doesn't put quite as much pressure on the front teeth and uh, just has some advantages, uh, but they, this device works well, and I would say it's arguably one of the most tested, validated devices out there. Would, wouldn't you say, Rich? As far as like a lot of the, the Hokuma study was done with this one, I mean, a lot of the studies were done yeah, with I, the tap. A lot of studies, you know. Certainly, if we had Keith Thornton on here, he would he be quoting all of these studies and how many there are. Uh, it is absolutely the the most studied device out there. And, you know, to be honest, we don't have a lot of studies where we take the same patient, we use one device, and then we put him in a different device and a different device. We don't have that, you know, but as Keith would say, what we do have is a lot of studies where people have really severe sleep apnea, and we treat them really well with a tap. We don't have a lot of studies with the other devices where we do that. And I actually take into account the disease severity when I'm thinking about doing a tap. I use that research for, for my benefit and the patient's benefit, you know, because if somebody's got an AHI of 120, you know, can you wear CPAP? Oh, I tried. How long did you try? A year. Wow, a whole year. You know, what's the deal? Well, you know, I just can't wear it. I can't do that. It's too much pressure, you know, all these other things. So I know I can put them in a tap. I can always, I'm always going to help them. I might take it from 120 to 30 or even 20. And that that's a whole lot better. Absolutely. But sometimes we can then do combination therapy. So I'm always looking at disease severity when we do that. Uh, I put the lip lickers in there because I never knew how much I did that <laughs> until I made myself one, you know, and, and I, it really bugged me, but I, I got over it in a week or so and your patients will too. So Again, we're trying to give you some principles to go by as far as more or less. Right. And the deep bite, I think Rich mentioned that. You got the overbite, and then you add the tap hook. You're up 18 millimeters. Uh, I, I've tried the tap, and I wore it. I can wear it. I actually had it as my backup device, and I forgot my regular device when I went to Colorado, actually, a year ago in the spring. And I wore it for five days out there, and after the first couple of days, I got used to it. But at first, I was just a little bit panicked because I can't breathe through my nose. I will mention this one. If you do it without the posterior stops and just hit the front, it's like having an NTI built in. So it's great for the Bruxers, not great for the joint. So keep that, you know, keep that in mind as we're doing this. And I'm with Rich. Uh, I just feel this is the one I'm going to pull out of my bag of tricks for the severe disease. Just feeling confident it's an old battle wagon. We know it's going to work well. And we know if anything's going to get to their HI down to where we uh, feel comfortable with it, that we, we've got a good shot with the tap. I mean, the other ones work as well, but we're going to, gravitate towards this one. So the EMA. EMA is, uh, I'll just describe it and we'll talk about the pros and cons. It's typically most of the ones you're going to see are made with, uh, uh, what is it, Bizacryl suck down type material. 
Um, there are some that do it a little differently than that, but uh, typically that's that's what we do. The they put the buttons on the canine and first molar, and then you have an array of lengths of the, these straps and rigidities. The white are really flimsy. These clears are extremely stiff. The yellow and blues, where I live mostly, mostly with the blue, I think uh, uh, on most of these, I think they they hold up, but they're 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 not so hard to get on. And uh, and and these come in one millimeter uh, lengths as 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 we look at the, these different uh, uh, the the rigidities and the, and the length of them, we got to match it for the particular patient. So, Rich, I'd say the biggest claim to fame of this one is it's inexpensive compared to other ones, to, and it's aesthetically not. Um, patients look at it and go, "Oh, well, it's not all as much of metal and everything." It's, it's small. Uh, I think yeah. that'd be the two things that jump out to me that I, why we gravitate towards it. Patients look at that, and go, "Wow, that's it." Then they may say, wow, that's it, you're charging me what? you got to have that conversation. <laughs> you got to build value for your treatment. It's not about the piece of acrylic. It's about the treatment and the therapy. Uh, but I think that's it. I think the limitations on this, and I'll see what Rich has to add, if someone's real class two, like they've got a, you know, on the George Gage, they're minus 14 to minus one where they, you know, can, I, can barely even get their front teeth together. Depending on where they put these buttons, you may be in trouble. You may not even be able to put the longest strap on that without really bringing them far forward, and sometimes class three. And then if they're using the, the bisacryl and they have the teeth that are all crooked, it's hard to, sometimes to get it to fit tightly enough so they don't pop out of it, but also get around uh, the uh, undercuts. There's there's a lot of other things listed there, Rich. There's anything else that jumps out at you that... Uh, you know, I put it, I, I put in there the snaggle tooth, you know, uh, because people with really crooked teeth, right. you, you, you know, you're gonna engage so much of an undercut. So you have to block out a lot if you think about that That's line of contour on those teeth, you know, so, um, no, like you, like you said, you know, the, uh, you know, they're missing their molars on the bottom, right? We talked about that earlier right. again, you know, these are all things. And, you know, you mentioned cost as a factor, um, that that's, I, I just want to spend 30 seconds on that guy because sure. what, when I started doing this, I'd have my, you know, seven or eight appliances out that I was familiar with. And I, I'd say, well, I, I, you know, I really think that this tap is the best one for you. And they go, no, I, I want that one with the rubber bands on it because you said it's the cheapest one. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm afraid you might tear that one up because you're kind of clinching pretty hard. And, you know, you, you know, it's not quite as robust. And, you know, pretty soon the buttons are popping off and, you know, this and that. And I had problems with it. So I quit doing that. I say, here's all my devices. You know, they all cost the same amount of money. So there, there's various ways to do this. You got to figure out what works best for you. But the reason I quit was because patients a lot of times chose the less expensive device. Yeah, and you and also, I didn't think that was. You also run the risk. We, you know, as you know, Rich, we do some consulting. I was in one of our offices a few months ago doing consulting and they had all the devices out there. Well, 45 minutes later, after detailed explanation of all the devices, the patient finally chose one, you'd think they were buying a new truck. I mean, the, the amount of effort that went into it, I think the patient can get overwhelmed. You're the doctor, uh, make a decision, say, here's what I think you should do. And I think you're really good at that. You could be cautious uh, about this. If you lay all the devices out there and say, here they all are, I, I promise you, you're gonna end up at times having long conversations that should be avoided by you making the decision uh, and leading them. Here's the device I think you should have and why is the way is the way I do it in my office and agreed that the cost I like is, that. You know, not the number one factor. You're the, you're the captain. Yeah, you're, you're the, the doctor. captain of the ship. This you know, is, I, this you is know what the, I think uh, you need. This is why. I don't I need a, a partial knee replacement. Um the orthopedic surgeon's not laid mm -hmm. out all the different brands there and let me choose which one I'm going to put in my knee. I think he's going to probably make that decision for me when when that comes down to it. So all right, a couple more and then we'll get to some questions here. The dorsal overall, one of my favorite devices, uh, you know, it wor works like the dorsal wing. We have different ways we can adjust it. The wing itself can move or this little block of acrylic can move as we turn the screw. And um, it has a lot of the same things I would say as the herps. Uh, allows your mouth to open, good for mouth breathers. Uh, it's one, of the, one of the questions was, what are the most comfortable devices out there? I think some form of the Dorsal design can be one of the most comfortable devices out there because you can put it in one piece 
and then put the other piece in so it's not claustrophobic. You can line it with the rubber material. Um, patients can open and swallow. You can talk and talk with mine in place. It doesn't give you a ton of lateral movement though, so uh, they can break, uh, kind of like, like the herps in the same respect. I put this limited space in the vestibule. Uh, what I mean is this is kind of thick back here on some of the devices. And now some of them I'll show you the prosomnus coming up. It's a type of dorsal. It's not thick back there, at least the, the one iteration is it. And sometimes if they're really tight back there, that can pinch. So I'd say that's one thing you kind of be, if they have that coronary process tilted in. But great for people who have minimal teeth and you want them to be able to open and not pop out of it. And certainly great for nasal breathing like myself, uh, obstructed nasal breathing, I should say. Because it's not claustrophobic. Yeah, because we we can put an anterior opening in there, you know, and we do that quite a bit, you know. So the w one extreme would be, you know, I, I make it hit everywhere when I can breathe through my nose, but when I can't breathe through my nose, but I still want to use a dorsal, then I, I I open them up a couple of millimeters in the anterior, and I have a couple millimeter gap there. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I I couldn't breathe the day I was through my nose the day I was born, and I've had five surgeries, and I still can't breathe through my nose, so. If I make myself a dorsal like that, I have a real hard time with it because you know now my jaw is falling back a little bit. You know, if I if I have rubber bands and I use rubber bands, now I'm closing that gap, but now I can't breathe. So that's why we keep that anterior opening in there. Absolutely, and the angle of this wing will make a difference as to whether the jaw will drop open. So you might want to add the rubber bands. Uh, one of my favorite. Dorsals these days, we do a, f a fair amount of prosomnus, and these are milled devices that basically they uh, for the IA they just mill uh, the, the wings in different positions. So you can just get a new tray, and that wing will be in different positions. So there's no moving parts, and you can see how that's at 90 degrees, and so that prevents the jaw from just following open. So you usually don't need the rubber bands, and then they they do have a CA version which also combines the uh, lower wing with an, uh, a, an advancement that you can do at home. So uh, it's a type of dorsal I consider, but it's really one of the more high end. And I think it um, it, it really uh, is comfortable because it can be made so thin because it's made out of uh, milled acrylic and, and the density of the acrylic is thinner, um, can be thinner and then far less porous to, to, to some of the stuff we were talking about with the, uh, the lining materials. All right, one last device, and uh, well, they're just showing how there there's different ways of ordering the the prosomnus. Uh, again, it's a fantastic device as well. And then uh, we'll give you an extra one. We talked about four devices. I guess uh, that is four if you count the prosomnus as a uh, as a dorsal. The fifth one being the the newest uh, 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 technology, I guess I should say, uh, or one of the newer technologies. And this is a 3D printed device. It's a polymer. So it's, you know, uh, with, the, with that technology and uh, the advantage to this is it can be very thin, very light, and one of the most durable devices out there. We really didn't talk about it. If you, if you want something not to break, taps hold up really well usually. And then if I think someone's going to destroy everything, this is probably one of the devices that I'm going to uh, strongly consider because even though it looks very flimsy, uh, that material is very, very strong, holds up well. Uh, the biggest disadvantage, Rich, I don't know what, what, what your considerations are, but in Florida, we have a lot of old people with a lot of restorative work that are kind of shaky, and it's really hard to adjust this. You can't add acrylic to it. Um, it's very thin, so even if they get a new crown, you can't really uh, readily make room for it, and it can be uh, it can be a little bit difficult to, to adjust. So if their dentition's going to need a lot of dental work, then uh, I would steer away from this. Other than that, it's a good device. Uh, uh, it has different arms here and it's extremely sturdy. Anything else to add? Yeah, that's, oh, that stuff's amazing. There, there are a couple other, you know, companies and people that are coming out with these types of printed devices, and uh, it, it's exciting. You know, we live in exciting times. You know, things are changing. Don't, don't, don't overthink it either. You know, I think that's one thing that you should take away from this is you can't make a wrong one, but you can make a better one. So. Don't, don't don't overthink it. You know, dentists are f famous for that. We've we get to teach a lot of dentists, guy, and right. don't don't you think it's fair to say most of them overthink pretty <laughs> much everything in their life? You know, I would say, but yeah. uh, you know, uh, th things are changing. Times are changing. That's one of the things. If you're just getting into this, you know, that's what guy and I. That's what we do is we teach dentists how to do this and how to do it better. So I, I certainly educate yourself, and you know, I. 
I, I don't know how to practice without DS3, you know, doing what we're doing. So the, right. I think the more you do this, the more challenges you have. You, you know, and we, when I started Guy 20 years ago, I didn't know who to call. Right. You know, now we have all these webinars and all this education out there. So it's a good thing. So if you're, you're just getting into this, you're certainly getting into it at a good time. And it's a little bit easier and take advantage of all these opportunities that you have. I, I want to address one question on here. Uh, this uh, used to be called a Narval years ago. There was another company. The current iteration of the 3D printed polymer is Panthera or DSADS, another word they go by. It's the same company, DSAD, it stands for Digital Sleep Apnea Device, I believe. So uh, that's the, uh, the the current one of, of these. Uh, you know, two public service announcements. Well, number one, tell them to keep it away from your dogs. This is my dog, that's my device. Uh, you know, so, I mean, all the time, make sure you mention that this happens more than I like to admit, even in our practice still, that the the, the, the dogs uh, get a hold of these. And then make sure you're doing some sort of repositioner to get the jaw to go back. We could spend hours on on side effects. Most side effects go away. And if we'll just use these repositioners, um, I like the AM aligner in the front area. Basically, the idea is to get the jaw to go back every morning, have your patients do two things. They need to, on a regular basis, ideally every day, it doesn't have to be every day, they need to evaluate their bite and they need to do something to get their bite to go back into its normal position. If they'll do that, the biggest side effect of bite changes uh, is mitigated a great deal. Now, does all patients do that? No, but if they'll check their bite and use a, a, some sort of a, a realigner, it will make a, uh, make a huge, huge uh, difference. Okay, and last thing we want to talk about before uh, we get to these questions are once you give someone a device, we just want to give you at a high level um, what we do. They get the device, we make sure it's comfortable. Yes, is are you wearing it? Yes, is it working? If the answer is no, we adjust it, okay? And then we ask them that again at a follow-up appointment or a follow-up call. Well, I know that's really high level, but what do we mean? I'll show you in a moment how we do that, but we ask them about snoring, sleepiness, what your goals of treatment are to start with. Was, was it the decreased snoring? Is the snoring better? Then let's, let's evaluate that. And then once we feel it is working, we do some sort of a follow-up sleep test. And um, we will do webinars about the treatment phases, which we'll talk for an hour about these steps. But I think that comes up a lot when we do this. How do we do this? We don't just hand them the device and say, good luck to you. We identify what their goals of treatment are, and then we ask them how they're doing. So we do that through the DS3 software. We ask them things like Epworth, snoring levels, energy levels. This would be our baseline. Uh, sleep quality, waking per night. They come in, we ask them those again. And at a glance, if you know what Epworth is, we can tell the person's not as sleepy, their snoring's better. In this case, we, the answer might be, yes, it is working. Or maybe these numbers aren't as good as this. And they would say, well, I'm still snoring some. Then we're going to either do one of a few things. We're going to move the jaw forward, most likely. We can open up the bite sometimes, but we don't do that that often. Talk to them about getting to breathe through the nose or add elastics to, to decrease the amount the jaw opens. But typically, the majority of the time, it's just move the device forward, uh, some sort of an increment, maybe a half millimeter every week or so. So again, that's at a high level. I just We just wanted to make sure that um, that we went over that with you and the same thing with the sleep test. We'll do that in multiple positions as well. And the DS3 software allows us to see three or four nights in a row. So uh, I wanted to get here towards the end so we can kind of uh, do the closing and then get to the answers. There's a, quite a few questions up here, Rich. I think um, uh, that all this information, shotgunned, you know, fed them with a fire hose tonight about all this stuff. I think it really comes down to the attitude. If you're willing to do this, you're willing to put some effort over to the right. We can see, you know, you're, you're, you're putting, you're nurturing this. It's not, as you said many times, hey, uh, join the webinar and it's, it, it's, it, it, this will happen on its own. You've got to put some effort into it. Uh, we are here to help you. That's why we have this. And you can bring this to your practice and be very successful and, uh, and, and really enjoy bringing this to your practices. Um, if you come to one of the courses, again, if you want to come to one of the courses and get the $200 off, just type course. It doesn't obligate you, but it secures the $200. We will go through each of these steps. We call it the four pillars, but these are the steps of treatment. 
where we talk about the sleeping uh, screener. We talk about how you get your patients tests, what are the laws in your states, what are the different ways of doing as PSGs and home tests, how we do consultations, what impressions and bite, the tricks of delivery, we'll do some hands-on things, uh, follow-up testing, you know, how do we coordinate that with our physicians, with our own equipment, with sleep testing companies, and then we do an annual recall. We will walk you through each of these steps. I don't know any other course that focuses like we do on what you do in your practice. So you got a two days, you go back with uh, everything you need to really safely get started doing this on your, on your patients Monday morning. Uh, it can bring a, a lot of value, not only to your patient's health and your practice health and your staff and team members for the enjoyment, it can bring a lot of value in, in, in monetary value. Uh, if you do as little as one device a month, even if you're just getting a moderate amount, which is uh, average in our country, maybe even lower than, than average, and an average lab fee, and you're paying someone else to do your insurance billing, and even if you're paying for our fees for this, you're looking at bringing in $19,000 for one a month, you do one a, a week, you're pushing six figures of uh, bringing into your, into your uh, practice. There's nothing you can do that has a higher potential for uh, bringing revenues into your practice. So those are the four pillars, screening, testing, treating, billing, and we will help you with the uh, four steps, which are education, coaching, software, and support. And when, when you hear this, I mean, it, it sounds uh, at a high level, but we literally hold your hand through this process. So if you want to know more about that, just type in consultation. And so uh, here I promise to have the uh, courses again. So I'll leave that up for a few moments. And Rich, have you been looking at these questions and we can start? Answering? Yeah, I have. There's a couple of good ones. You know, one was the BPA, the bisphenol A. Um, I texted Mark uh, Murphy, who's kind of a dental materials expert. He does teach some of our uh -huh. uh, DS3 courses. He's a great guy, a uh, great teacher. Um, and you, you know, the, uh, acrylic doesn't have it, but the polycarbonates do, uh, as he said, as far as he knows, there's no known toxicity for that, but in a patient sensitive to that, we'd certainly want to stay away from it. Uh, the other one I want to talk about is, you know, if a patient has been referred to you by a sleep MD for oral appliance, but the patient needs a lot of dental work, poor dental condition, what do you do? You know, you yeah. make them an oral device or do you do that? I will tell you how a dentist would answer that. A dentist would say, well, it depends on his teeth and how bad they are, you know? Um, after 20 years, I would answer that by, it depends on how bad his sleep apnea is. Mm -hmm. So the last time I checked, you don't have to have your teeth to live, but you do have to have oxygen. You know, so, not overrated. Yeah, I keep saying <laughs> it's that. not overrated, no. So, <laughs> You know, again, use use your brain. You know, I mean, how bad is their teeth? You know, they're gonna lose them all anyway. Then you know, they're 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 what what difference does it make? You know, um, but it, but I think it gives us as a dentist a very good opportunity to say, hey, now's your chance. You tried CPAP, you couldn't wear it. You're not really a surgical candidate. This is your chance to save your teeth and save your life. Because if, if you lose your teeth, then we can't make you a dental, re, a mandibular repositioner. You know, I, I have heard dentists say over the years, man, that was what finally got that patient over the hump. You know, for 10 years, I had this treatment plan for all this stuff, and I wouldn't do anything, and their mouth was deteriorating, it was getting worse. They get a sleep test, they're diagnosed with sleep apnea, they don't want to lose their teeth. Now they have this sense of urgency about doing it. So I think you got to be real careful there. I look at it like, how bad's your sleep apnea? If it's off the charts bad, I'm gonna make them a tap. I'm gonna put thermocurl in it. I'm gonna tell them they might even lose a tooth if there's a couple of loose ones. I love are you it. okay with me? If you're okay with me charging you for that, you know, even though your device took it out, I'm kidding, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> no, no extra fee for the extraction, I think is what you're but, saying. But, but again, you <laughs> you know, you have to be careful. You have to use your brain on that. But if they've got an HIS-7 right. and they're not sleepy, they're not tired, they don't have high blood pressure, then yeah, kick the guy in the butt and tell him to get his teeth fixed and then you can do it. So yeah. I like that. I'm going to use that again. So I'm going to reiterate what you're saying. When, when it comes to that question, I'm going to answer it like a physician. How bad your apnea? Uh, right. We're putting the health above the teeth, uh, which is the way it should be. Uh, I think. I mean, is uh, breathing. And that's not. That, but that's not what most dentists no, most do. Dentists because that, that's that's not what teeth. we were trained. Absolutely. You know, we're trained to fix teeth. Absolutely, I love it. 
I think that's that's fantastic. Um, one other thing I'll mention, I'm going to see a lot of these people. We had uh, several hundred registers, over 100 on here tonight. See a lot of familiar names. Looking forward to seeing you all uh, Thursday, our uh, North American Dental Sleep Medicine Symposium. I think we were down to eight tickets left, so it's probably sold out. If you want to make a last-minute trip to Florida, you might might look into it. It's going to be a great meeting. we got a, a fantastic uh, group of lineup. If you can't make this one, Stay tuned to the next webinar or look at our website. We'll, we're doing it, I think, the first weekend of March in 2021. Uh, it's one of the best uh, sleep meetings in the country. I think you'll uh, you'll really enjoy it. So looking forward to seeing you what there, are, Rich. Yeah, what are you going to talk on, Guy? I am going to talk on this, the DS360 Premier Tier. Uh, this is a service that we offer in a, a limited number of dental offices each year. We've been doing it a couple years now. Uh, we're doing about eight per year where we're uh, going into their practices, they're coming to our practice, they're going to your practice, as you know, and we're being hands-on consulting, meeting with these practices monthly, if not more often, and we're analyzing their, their challenges and helping them uh, overcome the challenges. And our team that's been doing this, we sat down and said, what are the, you know, we're preparing reports and we're working on tasks, and what is the overlapping common things that all these offices are challenging? And there's a handful of things that every one of the offices are having challenges with and we're going to talk about those challenges and what that they can do to overcome them and if anybody's ever interested in this program uh, feel free to just type in DS360 Premier Tier we certainly just need to talk to you about it it's certainly not for everyone but uh, if you want to take your dental sleep practice to the next level we're we, we, we get to know each other real well uh, myself Rich and you personally and our team it's something that we uh, really proud of what we've been doing for the last couple of years, and it's um, really going well. And I, I, I tell you, it's, uh, Rich, one of the things that uh, I think really gives our team, we have a whole team full of, uh, pushing a couple dozen team members in our in our business, but uh, I can tell you when we talk about the DS360, everybody lights up because it's uh, a lot of reward because we're seeing practices go in the directions that they define at the beginning. So that's what I'm talking about, those challenges. What about yourself? Uh, titration protocols, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we, 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 we're always, you know, we're talking about, Hey, how do you get a patient? You know, it's like the, you go back to those four pillars, you know, how do we get insurance covered? You know, how do we get paid? How do we, how do we treat them? You know, and then how do we do follow up and how do we do titration sleep testing? So, uh, I'm going to talk about that. There's some pretty cool things coming out, um, on the horizon that I think are really going to change how we do this. It has it has always been and still is in my office a struggle for doing that. You know, when you make, we made 86 devices in January, guy. Wow. If you if you do that three months in a row, by the time the fourth month, the fifth month comes right. around, you're trying to get 200 people sleep tested. Wow. You better have a system. You, you better have something in there that goes on with this. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, man. Uh, please, 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 if you come uh, to the to the symposium, uh, grab myself or Guy and say hello. Yes. Um, it, it means a lot to us that that somebody's out there listening when we're talking. I mean, Guy and I got better things to do than just like you do, we, but we're very appreciative and thankful that you guys get on. But, but say that, we need some of that feedback too. I do. I don't know about you, Guy, but I will tell you, uh, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, when we teach this and we do that, I, I that's how I lost all this hair, you know, worrying about that. Because that's why we started the company that we did was to help dentists uh, do more of this and do better. So please come by and say hello. Yeah, and that's a meeting uh, in a couple of days. It's great for that because we, we will hear stories of how dental sleep has changed uh, dentists' lives and how... Uh, our efforts have helped with that, and that's uh, uh, I'm a little more hands-on involved day to day than you are in that, Rich. And I tell you, it, uh, um, when I'm you know missed my son's football game tonight, missed the flag football game tonight, maybe what you all can do is go out and do this in your practices, help someone live better and live longer. And uh, you know the fact that my son won his flag football game and I wasn't there, I think maybe it was a good trade off of our time. If, if there's yeah. more people out there living, so. I hope you all will come to a course too in the future. I look forward to doing that. They're not huge courses. We'll have you know 15 to 40 people at these courses, and usually it's somewhere closer to the, the beginning. Uh, you know, enough for us to really spend quality time together. Uh, and uh, uh, if we if you come to it, I promise you'll you'll leave with what you need. 
So we're, I think we got all the questions. If you have, uh, if, you know, if anybody else wants consult, of course, type that in. I see one last question. The biggest challenge to getting is getting more MD referrals. Uh, that's really not the topic tonight, but I think we can, I can give you, uh, first of all, yes, that is a challenge. That's one of the bigger challenges. Um, and what you can do for that is to communicate like a physician. You know, uh, Rich, uh, how many letters do you think, did you look in the software, how many letters you wrote last year? I did. I can tell you. 9,689. My gosh, 9,000 letters. I don't, that, that, that's not a fishing story uh, because we have to communicate with these physicians. You've got those 70 patients a month, and we gotta, we got to make sure we treat them, uh, treat them right. And so uh, if we – Ask me how many, many lunch and learns I did last year. You're doing what, one a day more or less, right? So, gosh. I did 158 last wow, year. Wow, 158. So that's uh, how you get the MD referrals. You do a good job of communicating. <laughs> And you go meet with them, and the, the, you do the letters, and then you call them on the phone after you tr finish yeah. your, your patients and say, how do we do? What can I do better? Uh, it, there's no silver bullet for that um, other than uh, communication. And, uh, and I'm saying that from letters to going to them, to talking with them, and putting the time and effort into that, and then it can pay off for years to come. Any other? You're, you're the king of this, Rich. Any other advice? Well, on that? I... I would just tell you also, Dr. Rush Worker, that some of them get it and some of them don't. You know, I, I did a lunch and learn a couple of months ago and there were six or seven doctors in there. They all had their computers out and I just quit talking and I wanted to see how long it would take before they noticed that I quit talking. I'm like, look, your time's valuable, so is mine. Right. You know, you I brought you guys lunch. The, the the least courtesy you can do is give me five minutes of your undivided attention. And everybody kind of, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I, I wanted to just shake the dust off my feet and, you know, keep keep running down the road. That that didn't go well, but some of them go very well. So again, it's a numbers game. Think about it like it's a numbers game. You know, right. be prepared, be knowledgeable, be confident, <clears throat> communicate. You know, doctors, what kind of letters do, do the doctors want? Right. They want three sentence letters. Right. Anything more than three sentences, they don't read. So keep everything short, keep it, you know, concise, as simple as you can make it. Every time we get a referral, we pick up the phone and we thank, personally thank the office for sending the patient. We verify the information they faxed over is correct, like phone numbers and things like that. You know, we write the letters. So a lot of stuff with communicating, but it it's just, you know, a numbers game and you have to get out there. You know, I, I looked at my, uh, my marketing guy, his name's Grant, and the, the doctor said, oh my gosh, I had no idea that as a dentist you could do this. I, I had no idea that insurance actually covered them. I had no idea that they worked as well as they possibly can. And I looked at Grant and I said, you know, 3,000 more doctors to go in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. That's how many still don't uh, know my name. Well, They've never heard of me. They've never heard of any of this stuff. So you, you got to take it on yourself to get out there and, you know, do fight, fight the good fight. Right. Uh, do you, do you want to mention a uh, same or similar guy? We got a few people still hanging on. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I can. Um, I was going to mention something, and I lost my, my train of thought with what you were saying sorry. there. But uh, no, it's not your fault that I'm losing. You know, oh, what was it about the ND referrals or? Uh, yeah, it was, but I, I can't. Uh, I, I, uh, that doesn't matter now. If I think of it, I'll let you know. Yeah, we can talk about the same and similar. Someone asked about that. It's off topic, but I'm happy to uh, for anybody that wants to, to hear about that. Same and similar is not a new rule. It's an existing rule from Medicare. Uh, on Medicare only that we know of as now it could affect commercial insurance. To my knowledge, it has not. It's affected two of the four regions of of, of the what we call the LCDs for Medicare. Uh, Medicare has payments that they'll pay and impose for these LCDs. The gist of it is Medicare doesn't want to pay for same and similar treatments. They don't want to pay for someone to get a CPAP and a dental device. And it's not a new rule, but they've just started enforcing it. And so um, what you have to do now is if someone has Medicare and you're one of those regions, 
uh, which the regions I'm not, it's not in our region, Rich. <laughs> I know that much yet, but it's, uh, I forget the two that it's in. You have to, if it's been over five years, Medicare doesn't care because they'll pay for a new CPAP or a new dental device. If it's been under 90 days and they just got a CPAP and they're trying it out, as long as they take the CPAP back in and document that they're not wearing it anymore and that they turn it back in and Medicare never paid for the CPAP because they didn't make it through the 90-day trial, you're fine. The problem is if they got a, a, a CPAP greater than 90 days that Medicare pays for in less than five years, they may very likely deny the claim. So you need to go to the websites that publish that and tell you where um, – where, where, uh, when they were billed, uh, we can provide you with those. If you want to type consult and ask more about it, uh, one of our billing uh, personnel will get on and tell you where you can look that information up. So, patient comes in, you just look and see. Hey, have they been charged? Has Medicare been charged for the CPAP? So, uh, did I miss anything on that? Well, I remember it goes the other way too. We make a dental True. device for somebody and it doesn't work. You know, they can bring it back. We can now write the letter and say, hey. They tried it. It didn't work. You know, now they're available to, to get CPAP and get reimbursed. That goes so, back to the other question. I've been using that in my lunch and learns with the physician saying, hey, I know you all just slap everybody in a CPAP. I don't say slap, but, uh, you know, you've just given everybody a CPAP. You realize if you give them a CPAP and they can't wear it uh, and, and a year later they're, they're not wearing it, now they can't get a dental device. And you've, you you really owe it to them to let them know that they have these options because they got to decide because they only get to pick one. So, you know, uh, I'm kind of using it to get the physicians to be more proactive. Uh, uh, About their follow-up. Right. And that's a great, that's a great topic, uh, Mel, for Lunch and Learns. Absolutely. You know, when you think about that and you're doing that, it's like, hey, it's not the end of the world, but if you give them a CPAP, you got to remember only about one in three is going to wear it. Right. So be diligent in your follow-up. Right. You know, the challenge with this guy is, they, the, the, the payers have taken away all the incentive, you know, and all the reimbursement for this. I know that what I see in San Antonio is I see, I see physicians who have to do a lot of stuff that they can't charge for and they can't get reimbursed for, and, and they're getting beat down over it, right. just like I would be. You know, I would like to say, hey, I'm above that, but I don't think that's the case. You know, the other thing I will say is seven times last year, Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I had a physician look me in the eyes and say, if I give you a patient, what do you give me? Oh, jeez. You're like, are you really asking me for what I think you're asking me? And they say, yeah. Uh. I, I, guy said, I'm the generator. I generate all these patients for all these people. And I can't make a living doing what I'm doing. And I said, man, I'm really sorry that you can't do that. Oh. And then I came back to my staff and I said, you know what? If within a month we're doing 200 devices instead of 100, y'all will know that I'm on the take. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Be because it takes, it takes time to build that up. You right. have to do a lot of lunch and learns. You have to educate uh, the physicians, you have to do talks, go do talks for rotary clubs and lions clubs and awake groups and your right. Bible study at church and your, you know, whatever the heck, you just get out there and talk about it as much as you can. Absolutely. Well, I don't see any uh, new questions. Uh, I thank you for the people stay late. Hey, you know, you're going to get your CE if you quit at eight <laughs> or nine, rather eight central. I uh, look forward to seeing anyone who's coming to the symposium. Here's how you get a hold of us if you have any more questions. Uh, we hope to see at one of our courses uh, coming up. We hope to see at our symposium. We hope to see on our future webinars. Uh, if you have uh, any questions between now and then, just give the give a call to the office or send an inquiry, and we'll we'll help you out. Uh, Rich, I will see you Thursday afternoon. I think you get in. Uh, we're awesome. Not Looking forward to seeing you guys. Looking yeah. forward to seeing everybody who's coming to the symposium. Again, please stop by and say hello to us. And yep. uh, thank, thank you guys so much for uh, spending your evening with us. Guy, thank you for putting together a fantastic uh, PowerPoint, as you always do. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome, buddy. I'll see you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in a day and a half. Safe travels. I hope it'll be warmer here. I, I look, it's looking like a fantastic weekend, by the way. It's supposed to be warm and mostly sunny. So, all right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. <clears throat>